Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Could everyone please make sure that the mobile phones and other electronic devices are, sil are on silent or switch to airplane mode. Agenda item one is our first business today and it relates to the work programme. At its meeting on the 10th of March, the committee considered its work programme in private and it agreed a number of inquiries and evidence sessions it expects to conduct in 2015. These include an inquiry into women and welfare, a session of oral evidence on the impact of welfare reform on children's services, a session of oral evidence on the bedroom tax mitigation, and an inquiry into the welfare powers to be devolved following the recommendations of the Smith Commission. Now, there are a number of procedural points in connection with the work programme which must be agreed in public. So the committee is asked to agree the following points. A, that the consideration of any oral evidence received will be completed in private, after the end of the public session. B, that decisions on witness expenses will be delegated to the convener. C, that all draft reports will be considered in private. And D, to authorise the convener to seek approvals for committee events where necessary. Do the members agree to those proposals? Agreed. Okay. That allows us to go to agenda item two, which is an oral evidence session from Paul Gray, who's the chair of the Social Security Advisory Committee. The SSAC is an independent statutory body that provides impartial advice on social security and related matters. Paul has undertaken the first review of personal independence payments, which was mandated by the Welfare Reform Act 2012 for the Department of Work and Pensions. The SSAC has also produced a report this month on cha uh, changes into ESA regulations. Paul, welcome uh, to you, uh, to the committee. Uh, I believe you're here back in 2012, so I'd Indeed like I to was. start by asking <laughs> you to provide a brief opening statement, uh, and then I'll open it up to questions if you don't mind. So over to you. Okay, thank you very much, convener. Would, would it be sensible I talked about the PIP review and then I'm separately, happy for you to take as well as uh, uh, separately, if you want to ask me questions about the uh, SSAC role in relation to ESA, we can move on to those. But probably sensible to keep the two the two parts separate. I suspect. I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, so, as, uh, as you've said, um, I was invited by uh, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to undertake this first statutory review of PIP. Um, I think the first point I ought to make was um, the fact that I am uh, chair of SSAC is a kind of parallel role from the fact I was asked to undertake the, uh, the first independent review, and uh, I was conscious in responding to that invitation that I wish to avoid any possibility or perception of conflict of interest between the two roles, given the possibility that during the time I was undertaking the PIP review, there might be routine business on PIP coming to SSAC. So I can make clear at the outset that were that to happen, uh, I would uh, step outside SSAC in terms of consideration of any routine business on PIP so that I wasn't seen to be uh, wearing too many hats at once. As it happens, there was no business came to SSAC on PIP uh, and therefore the issue didn't arise, but I'm kind of keen to make that, that distinction uh, clear. Um, uh, when I started the re review in April, May uh, of last year, uh, there was already a huge amount of noise uh, around the early introduction uh, of PIP uh, as a result of the very major problem that had developed uh, around delays uh, in the processing and in particular uh, delays in uh, people being called to the, the new style PIP assessments. So uh, a lot of the kind of initial evidence I was gathering uh, was focusing very heavily on those delays. Um, uh, after, a, after a short period, I decided that um, uh, while um, it was important for me to uh, uh, understand the impact of the delays, there was already, there'd already been a lot of uh, uh, attention in the Westminster Parliament, indeed I think in, in this Parliament, uh, on those delay issues. Uh, and I decided that, although it seemed to me, and I've made clear in my report, uh, that resolving or completing the resolution of the delays was absolutely kind of fundamental priority, um, 
Uh, that, in my view, is a necessary but not sufficient uh, factor in, in order to address um, uh, a number of fairly major kind of underlying uh, issues in the way in which uh, the process uh, was operating. So what I've sought to do in the review is, is to, as it were, look beyond and behind the delays and kind of focus on what seem to me important underlying issues that ought to be addressed even as and when the delays issue uh, is resolved. Um, uh, I also, given the fact this was a statutory review um, uh, uh, mandated, uh, as you said, convener, by the, the Welfare Reform Act, uh, I felt it was right uh, that I should take the, the broad structure uh, and, the, uh, and the broad parameters of the assessment criteria that had been established uh, in legislation uh, as broadly given. Uh, there had been major processes of consultation which had led up to the final design and although, as I say in the report, it was, it was clear that uh, those might, might not have been commanding universal support, it seemed to me the right focus for me in undertaking the review uh, was not to be kind of reviewing the basic parameters uh, of what Parliament had decided uh, in Westminster uh, but looking at uh, uh, the way in which uh, the whole process was being implemented. So as I gathered and distilled the evidence I was getting from a whole range of uh, approaches, a lot of written evidence that I, I received, but I also had lots of, uh, of meetings, focus groups with claimants, uh, talking to all the, all, all the players involved, a lot of conversations with uh, the organisations representing uh, uh, disabled people. As I distilled all that evidence, it seemed to me the issues uh, fell under three uh, broad headings, uh, as indeed has been summarised in, in the report I think you've, the committee's had from, from SPICE. First was issues around uh, uh, the claimant experience uh, of going through the process uh, of claiming PIP and then uh, ultimately receiving a decision. Secondly, uh, processes and procedures around the obtaining of evidence uh, uh, to support that assessment and decision-making process. And thirdly, issues around the, the overall effectiveness uh, of the assessment. And in very broad terms, uh, I think my, my summary findings under those three headings are that as far as the claimant experience is concerned, even discounting, if you like, or putting to one side uh, the very unfortunate uh, reality of, of long delays, is that on its current design, uh, the claimed experience is a very disjointed one uh, uh, for claimants and that there are kind of important issues to be addressed there. As far as obtaining the necessary evidence is concerned, it, uh, I was very strongly struck, the more discussions and conversations I had, particularly with claimants, that um, uh, uh, the PIP process is widely viewed and seen as being about, in, in quotes, having a medical. Uh, in fact, the whole way in which the, the benefit has been designed uh, sought to emphasise uh, that uh, this is an assessment of the functional impact on disabled people of underlying uh, health conditions, not an assessment uh, purely and solely uh, about the medical conditions. But what I found as I observed assessments uh, in process and, uh, and other sources of evidence uh, was that there were a number of ways in which uh, the process seem to me to feel kind of over-medical and, and under-functional. Uh, and also, I thought that the, the current arrangements for collecting uh, the evidence, frankly, whether kind of medical or functional, uh, uh, currently leaves uh, a fair amount to be desired. And then in terms of the overall effectiveness of, of the PIP assessment process, uh, my kind of summary conclusion was frankly it was a little bit too soon to judge is it 
uh, uh, being effective uh, in the way it's intended. There was still, even by the time I got to the end of my review in, in December, uh, quite a, a limited number uh, of um, uh, awards or decision awards uh, being reached. Uh, I could see some indications that suggested to me that there were, there were questions to be asked uh, about the consistency and reliability uh, of those early early outcomes, but that evidence was frankly rather patchy. So in that third area of my focus, I've concentrated the recommendations I've made about ensuring uh, that uh, processes and systems are significantly improved uh, so that as the caseload starts to build uh, under the rollout of PIP, uh, there will be much more reliable means of assessing uh, the fairness and consistency of the awards across uh, uh, different claimant groups. So those are my kind of three broad kind of areas of focus. Um, uh, and again, in the, in the SPICE uh, report that you've had as a committee, there's a kind of summary uh, of uh, my key recommendations, of which there were 14 in all. Um, uh, uh, spread across those three main areas of focus. But I also decided to make another three-way split uh, in my recommendations in terms of the time period in which I was recommending they should be fully implemented. Um, and the first group, uh, unimaginatively I called the short-term uh, recommendations, were things that I emphasised I should thought should be fully completed uh, before the PIP rollout uh, gets to the stage uh, of what's been termed managed reassessment. And I think this is a, a kind of a rather critical point to, to focus on. Uh, as the committee, I'm sure, is aware, the rollout has been phased uh, with all the early focus being on new claimants to PIP, people who are not in receipt of the legacy benefit uh, DLA uh, but are coming fresh to the process. Uh, there's also been, uh, and the great majority of claims which have so far been uh, decided on fall into that category of new claimants. There's been a fairly small proportion uh, of uh, reviews of existing DLA awards, either in the small minority of cases where that award was time limited at the time of the initial DLA award, or when uh, claimants um, have themselves concluded they wish to reapply uh, for PIP, possibly because they felt their, uh, the functional impact um, uh, of their conditions had significantly worsened since their original DLA award. But the great majority of um, current DLA claimants have yet to go through the PIP process. And the Westminster government's announced schedule is to start that, uh, that final but kind of principal stage uh, in the autumn of 2015. And the more I thought about this, that seems to me uh, the point at which uh, any kind of underlying difficulties, strains and tensions in the PIP process really come into sharp focus because it's at that point people who've been in receipt of a DLA award quite often awarded to them without any time limit placed on it will uh, face the start of a process of kind of mandatory reassessment uh, under PIP uh, and the Expenditure projections that the Westminster government uh, has provided as PIP was being developed and in successive budget documents uh, do uh, assume uh, that a significant proportion of existing DLA claimants will not receive uh, a PIP award or will, reduce, or, or will receive a lower uh, PIP award than DLA award. Also, in some other cases... Uh, the assumption is that people will receive a, a higher award under PIP. But in net overall terms, uh, the plans and the expectations of the, uh, of the Westminster government are for significant reductions 
uh, in uh, expenditure under PIP rather than DLA. And that uh, seems to me to be, uh, as that uh, process starts to roll out, uh, clearly uh, uh, the system is going to come under a lot more pressure. Seems to me to be one thing to, uh, however difficult, to say to a new claimant for PIP, I'm sorry, you haven't met the criteria, you haven't got an award. Um, uh, it seems to me to present a uh, significantly larger uh, issue and a challenge to say to somebody who's been in receipt of a DLA uh, award for some years, you have been reassessed for PIP uh, and we have concluded you're either uh, no longer entitled to any DLA award, uh, any PIP award uh, or to a reduced one. So that was why I'm, I wanted to focus the, uh, uh, put a sort of time plan on my recommendations and there's some things I thought it was absolutely essential ought to be kind of fully in place and properly operational before that next phase of the rollout started. Then there were some other things where, uh, again unimaginatively I called the medium term recommendations, um, which uh, I felt should be uh, uh, well on the way to implementation at the start of that phase. Uh, and finally one recommendation I termed long term where um, uh, I've recommended a, frankly, fundamental redesign uh, of the whole claimant process for PIP to make it much more integrated, uh, more joined up, uh, and in this day and age, increasingly uh, digitally enabled for the increasing proportion of people for whom that will become uh, a, a preferred uh, approach. Um, I was also influenced in, in making that sort of time split on my recommendations by uh, where the um, political calendar is in two respects. Firstly, that um, uh, we have the UK election in, in May 2015. Uh, so those recommendations I was making, which on any basis would take uh, a fair time to implement, are likely to fall in UK terms. Uh, to whoever forms uh, the next government uh, in Westminster. But secondly, toward, towards the end of my review period, we had the Smith process uh, uh, in Scotland. Of course, the uh, conclusion and recommendation there uh, uh, that PIP and some of the other disability benefits should be devolved uh, to this parliament and, uh, and this government. Uh, and therefore, I thought it was also appropriate to be flagging up some things I thought were for um, uh, more longer term consideration, uh, which could in, UK, could in UK terms fall under a different jurisdiction uh, and in Scottish terms certainly would fall to this, this government and this parliament. So uh, just to give a, a very quick flavour in conclusion of the, uh, where the focus of my specific recommendations were in terms of the claimant experience um, uh, I've stressed the importance of improving uh, claimant communications in all kinds of ways including a fundamental revamp of the decision letters that are sent to claimants once a decision is reached which I have to say I found quite difficult to follow and interpret and my suspicion was many claimants would find them at least as, uh, as difficult to understand. Uh, the importance of improving the relationships between different players in the decision process. The, the outsourced assessment providers, the health professionals doing the actual assessments, and the DWP uh, staff who actually make the final decisions based on the input from those assessments. Uh, I saw some evidence of improving relationships between those two groups, but I saw a lot of scope uh, for more work being done to make sure that was a better relationship and as a result, a much better process for uh, claimants. Um, and then in the, the longer term, as I've already indicated, uh, I think the, uh, the current process uh, can be made significantly better, much better joining up of different parts of the process. At the moment, it seems to me the onus is largely on the claimant to navigate their way around different bits of the process and ring up different people to find out 
where's my claim got to? It seems to me in this day and age, for any claimant or customer process, the onus should be on the providers, uh, in this case DWP and the outsource providers, to do the joining up uh, and to give kind of single points of contact uh, and ease of claiming. So that's, uh, I think, a quite fundamental long-term change. And in particular, allow claimants a simple way to check where their, where their claim has got to. At the moment, that is extraordinarily difficult. They're having to make lots of phone calls to different places, getting lots of, uh, of unsatisfactory hands-offs. In terms of improving the way evidence uh, is obtained, uh, I've recommended uh, looking at the scope for much better joining up of information that various parts of government or governments uh, already hold. At the moment, the PIP process is very insular and self-contained. There are quite a lot of people uh, who separately have to go through an assessment process for ESA, who also go through the PIP process. Um, DWP, during the review, did start the process of seeing if some of that information can be brought together. I've encouraged going a lot further. And I think there's potentially a lot more scope to think about other aspects of joining up around evidence, in particular in relation to social care assessments. Again, there's a significant overlap uh, of the caseload uh, uh, there. And I made some recommendations about the way in which the assessment, the face-to-face -face assessment processes um, operate. Uh, I felt that, having observed quite a number of them, uh, there wasn't enough uh, transparency uh, for claimants to see what information was being recorded by health professionals. And then finally, on the, the kind of effectiveness uh, of the assessment, I uh, highlighted two uh, specific aspects of the 12 criteria uh, for assessment, which I didn't think was working terribly well. What was termed uh, activity 11 around um, uh, understanding uh, people's mobility needs. I thought there was a lot of confusion there. Similarly, I thought the way in which people's need to use aids and appliances uh, uh, was possibly not being uh, implemented uh, in the way intended. But then, uh, looking a bit further ahead, I was quite concerned that, as I said earlier on, early evidence suggested to me there could be some inconsistency uh, uh, around the way in which awards are being made. I was particularly concerned uh, that focus should be given to ensuring people with um, mental health conditions uh, uh, or fluctuating uh, conditions to make sure assessments there are done consistently. Uh, and I was concerned to note that there wasn't uh, yet a, a full and proper evaluation strategy in place and published for how the department would over time, as PIP is rolled out, uh, be fully assessing uh, the consistency uh, of awards. So that kind of, I hope, gives a flavour of the areas of my recommendations. In terms of a response from the UK government, um, uh, uh, I'm pleased to say that um, uh, uh, the UK government agreed to publish my report as soon as it was completed uh, without making kind of any observation about the recommendations so that they were out there in the public domain. Everybody had an opportunity to see them. Uh, and then in, I think it was in February of this year, about two months after my report, uh, DWP has produced its initial response where it has focused just on my short-term recommendations, um, uh, uh, which was uh, frankly broadly what I'd intended in the way I'd structured the recommendations. I'm pleased to say out of nine of those recommendations, uh, something like eight and a half uh, have been fully accepted. The one that was only partially accepted, actually I'm quite happy the spirit of my recommendation has been uh, uh, met because uh, it's one thing for a government to say the recommendations have been accepted. Uh, it's another thing to see whether they've actually been fully implemented. So I kind of reserve judgment um, uh, uh, as to... Um, 
how comprehensively my recommendations will actually be implemented. Sorry, I've spoken a little bit too long, but I hope that's helpful, convener and members, to give the background to the review. Yeah, thanks very much, Paul. It's a, a very comprehensive background to the, the, the work that you've undertaken. I think it's, it chimes a lot with the, the information that we've had, the experiences that, that witnesses have told us about their um, journey through the, the system. We haven't looked in great detail yet at, at the PIP process because it's still in its infancy, if you like. It's, we, we still have to see how it, it does develop and, and wait to see how some of the statistics around the new system um, start to, to mount up. Uh, but it's, it has been made clear in Scotland at least that there is a hope that because the outsourced um, deliverer of the assessments is a public Se uh, sector body that there might be an, an improved service in Scotland in comparison to what might have been the case. In your assessment, did you look at the the work being done by Salas, or was it uh, was it not uh, part of your? Uh, I didn't. I, I didn't specifically <coughs> see any of the work of, of Salas. I did observe um, uh, assessments being undertaken by Atos, who's the prime provider, as it were, in, in Scotland and, and in other parts of, uh, of England, and also of Capita, who have significant parts of, uh, of England and Wales uh, in their coverage. Um, uh, so the assessments that I observed, I think, were very largely those undertaken by uh, as it were, the direct employees of Atos and Capita. But I had quite a lot of conversations uh, 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 with Atos about the way in which they were looking to uh, build and develop their own uh, supply network, which, as you say, includes uh, uh, some uh, public sector bodies in Scotland and, and indeed in England, quite a number of the, the subcontractors, if that's the... Uh, if that's the right phrase, uh, are public sector bodies. I didn't, uh, um, uh, uh, frankly, kind of observe um, any obvious uh, difference between uh, somebody who was technically employed by a private sector body and technically employed by a public sector body. Uh, generally, I was impressed uh, by... Uh, the commitment and capability of those particular health professionals uh, that I observed uh, in, in operation. Uh, and I think it's <coughs> important to uh, bear in mind you know, we are talking uh, uh, in terms of all the face-to-face, -face, indeed the paper assessments, uh, being undertaken by qualified health professionals, in a sense kind of regardless of technically who their employer is. Yeah. Um in terms of the the delays, um, initial discussions we've had with Salas have indicated that they believe that they are um, undertaking the assessments in the time scale that they would be expected to, but the delays are because of a lack of appointments being provided by the DWP. Is that your experience? Um, not entirely. Um, I mean, the appointment process... Uh, for the assessments um, uh, is essentially the responsibility of the assessment providers. <coughs> um, uh, uh, it's not, on my understanding, done directly via DWP. The, uh, kind of in broad terms, the, the different bits of the process people go through, the, there's uh, an initial process of engagement uh, with uh, the DWP to seek to uh, uh, determine some basic kind of issues of eligibility um, uh, to claim the benefit. Once uh, people have gone through that kind of stage one process, the stage through process of setting up um, uh, an assessment process is handed over to Atos and Capita and uh, I'm not sure exactly how Atos manage their, their relationships with their subcontractors in terms of, of making appointments. I think it's probably done centrally uh, uh, by Atos and Capita. So um, uh, I don't quite recognise uh, the point you make. What I do recognise is that there's then a, 
a third stage in the process after an assessment has taken place, um, uh, and that is when the paperwork goes back to the DWP for the, dis the formal decision-making process. Um, and if one, uh, my sense looking at where have the delays arisen for different people, they have been, uh, they haven't been particularly concentrated in one place, they've been kind of across those different parts of the process. So uh, to be frank, I, I think the uh, responsibility uh, for the delays is a shared one uh, between WP and DWP and the providers. Ultimately, uh, uh, DWP, I think, uh, as the people designing the system, uh, need to be accountable for uh, ensuring uh, the process works to best effect and clearly uh, both during the period of my review and since I was conscious of lots of discussions going on <coughs> between DWP and, pro and the providers to try to improve things. Okay, Kevin. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, Mr. Ray, thanks for uh, appearing before the committee today. Um, while the convener has already stated we haven't done a huge amount of, of work in this particular area as a committee, all of us have been out and about around the country um, talking to folks. And I have to say, in terms of the lack of communication which you've pointed out, um, from my experience, what I've been finding is panic uh, in most cases, uh, and in many cases, absolute terror, uh, because folks do not know what is happening uh, to them. Uh, and that goes for new claimants and also those folks uh, who are, are going to be reassessed, who have, have uh, no times yet uh, about when they're going to be reassessed. Obviously, you've pointed that out. Uh, what has the DWP response been to that? Because while folk are in this limbo, um, that panic, and in some cases, terror, will continue. Um, well, I think two things. One, um, uh, there clearly has been action taken to start to reduce uh, the delays, and uh, the Westminster government, I think, announced early this year that the the average delay uh, uh, was, uh, in terms of getting an assessment undertaken, was down to 14 weeks. Um, uh, I think, in terms of keeping people better informed, um, again, during the course of my review. Uh, there was a start of a process of where people had given their mobile phone contact, uh, seeking to send text messages proactively uh, to inform people a bit better uh, where things were. That was at a very infant stage. Uh, I've specifically recommended a lot more be done about that. Um, the, the underlying difficulty... Um, uh, about the way the the claimant process has been, has been set up is that the different um, IT systems do not talk to each other as effectively as they ought to. Um, so that uh, at the point uh, that uh, somebody has got through stage one uh, and is waiting for an assessment to take place with, uh, with the provider, uh, as I said to the convener, uh, most of the focus there is, um, uh, and most of the information is held by uh, the outsource provider. What I experienced and I regarded as entirely unsatisfactory was I sat in and listened on uh, telephone lines uh, on a number of occasions, both at DWP uh, and at both Atos and Capita, uh, and I was dismayed by the number of occasions on which some, I would sit in on a DWP call line, somebody would ring up and say, you know, can you tell me what, what you know, in their state of uh, panic or whatever, as you describe, uh, Mr. Stewart, saying, where is my case? Somebody would look on the um, uh, system notes they had at DWP uh, and say, uh, sorry, we don't know, you're going to have to ring up Atos, and vice versa. I saw the same things happening. I saw just kind of looking on people's screens, uh, people who'd rung up, you know, seven, eight, nine times, um, still not getting information. 
Uh, I spoke to in some of the focus groups I had with uh, uh, with claimants. Uh, two separate people told me, well, we've now got into a routine. We ring up at 10 o'clock every Monday morning uh, and we're still not getting the information. So I think, uh, sorry, to come more directly to your question, what have DWP done about it so far? I think they have taken action to try to reduce the delays. The amount that has been done and, and that it's possible to do with present systems to get into much more proactive um, contact with claimants to keep them up to date with where their claims are is fairly limited and that's why uh, I'm recommending uh, or moves as fast as it's possible to do to a position where there is a reliable single point of contact that claimants can come to and find out what is the status of their claim. Uh, I, I mean the figures that we have um, for January uh, 2015 in terms of average actual clearance times, median it says, um, for uh, new claims was 20 weeks from the point of registration to a decision made in the claim, 14 weeks from the point of referral to the assessment providers to a decision made in the claim, and 12 weeks for an assessment. That is a huge amount of time uh, for folk to be in limbo. It is. I agree. Uh, and the DWP, in terms of the systems that don't talk to one another between the providers and them, um, have they got special measures in place to try and resolve that situation? Um, in terms of systems talking to each other, I can't tell you exactly where they've got to. Um, uh, in terms of action to um, put in place sufficient resource to reduce those elapsed times, uh, then clearly there is a certain amount of action. My own view at the point I concluded the review was that more still needed to be done. I think just on your figures, I think it's fair to say the, the 20 weeks is the, is the total figure and the, and the other figures you gave is the, the periods within those 20 weeks for, for different parts of the process. Uh, okay. Um, People are extremely well informed about what these um, changes will actually mean. Uh, I mean, it's not unusual for folk to tell me that uh, they know that 100,000 folk in Scotland will lose all or part of their, their benefit bef by 2018. And they also know that in some cases um, they'll lose as much as, as £3,000. Um, in terms of that kind of situation... One of the things which has surprised me in terms of conversations I've had with, with folks, and probably a good example is talking to uh, multiple uh, sclerosis sufferers, MS sufferers, um, in Aberdeen not so long ago. Um, they were suggesting um, that the loss of the mobility components of their benefits uh, could lead them to, to having to stop work, or their carers having to stop work. You've looked at the processes of these changes. Have you looked at the impacts of these changes, which, uh, as suggested by some, may actually cost the state more? Uh, I mean, in terms of um, uh, uh, following uh, you know, kind of individual impacts, uh, the answer is no. Uh, I was fully aware of the um, uh, assessments that the UK government had made uh, as I referred to earlier, of the expected uh, impact of the changes from DLA to, to PIP. I think in terms of the position in Scotland, uh, you're probably referring to the, the analysis that the government did, which I think was referred to in the paper you have in front of you from, uh, from Spice, uh, uh, that points to the fact that some people uh, will get a lower award, some people will lose award, some people will get a higher award. Uh, in terms of the amounts of money, um, I, I'm not sure, to be honest, it's terribly helpful to talk about uh, what is the kind of average loss uh, that people uh, uh, will incur, because there will be quite a wide distribution. I mean, I did look up the figures of what is the average level uh, of a DLA, a DLA award in Scotland, and it's uh, £83 something. A week. 
So we're talking about uh, four and a half thousand a year or something like that. So, um, uh, and the uh, the maximum award uh, for somebody getting the maximum on uh, both the uh, what was in DLA known as the care element, in PIP is known as the daily living, and the maximum amount of the mobility, which is the same terminology for, for both awards, is £137 uh, a week. Uh, so there, somebody who's on the maximum, uh, we're talking about, sorry, I can't do the sums immediately, something like £7,000 uh, a year. So um, uh, what you will see in terms of the impact on individuals who have a changed level of award uh, will vary a great deal across that spectrum. Um, uh, there will be some people who will be getting a kind of increased uh, award within the spectrum, conceivably, but I suspect rather unlikely. Uh, you could have somebody uh, on a kind of maximum uh, award for both at the moment and getting a nil award. I think, frankly, that's extremely unlikely. What is much more likely is that there will be some people getting the maximum rate who might move to the lower rate. Some people getting the lower rate may move to a nil award and vice versa, um, uh, that you will have some people currently not getting a DLA award. Uh, and I think there's a particular group around people with mental health conditions uh, who, um, for whom the DLA process was frankly not well designed. And in my view, the PIP process is, and criteria is somewhat better designed. So you'll have some people uh, uh, moving up that income scale. But of course, the, the underlying rationale for DLA and PIP has never been, uh, uh, under this Westminster government or its predecessors, an income replacement benefit. And obviously, what is the impact on people's incomes is clearly uh, very important. But uh, in terms of thinking uh, ahead how in Scotland uh, you might want to uh, uh, redesign PIP, I think there are some fundamental questions to consider about is it right to kind of stick with uh, the current kind of philosophy uh, of PIP which is not as an income replacement benefit, it's not means tested, it's not taxed, uh, it's independent as to whether people are, are in or out of work, uh, whether those are the right criteria to hold or whether you would want to look at it more in terms of the impact on people's income. One of the key things that the Westminster government has stated uh, in terms of this welfare reform is to try and get as many folk into work or keep folk in work as possible. Now, one of the things which we found convener during the course of our deliberations in this committee is that many folks, uh, some people with very serious conditions, uh, want to work for as long as they possibly can. That is one of the things that we have found. I think it would be a tragedy um, that these changes will actually maybe impede folk from continuing to work, um, which, you know, is a great fear uh, amongst certain folk out there, uh, either impeding them from going to work or impeding their carers from going out to work, which actually creates, as they see it, a greater burden in the state because there will be less tax going back to the state uh, in terms uh, of, of them not being able to work any longer. And I think it would be really... Um, uh, well, I think it has to be done. Uh, a, a, an impact review on what these changes from uh, DLA to PIP will actually have on folks' ability to work. Um, the fact that we may be cutting off folks' independence even further by making these changes. And I just wonder if your body intends to look at these impacts to see if what is being done here actually um, is creating a situation where we are denying folk their independence and actually stopping folk from going out to work? Well, I think uh, I'd relate that to what I was saying about having a, uh, a much clearer evaluation strategy for PIP than I see existing at the moment. Uh, uh, I agree with you that an important criterion that ought to fit into an evaluation strategy is precisely your challenge. What impact... 
uh, is the introduction of PIP having uh, on, uh, on enabling people either to get into work uh, or, or to stay in work. And clearly that has always been an important design criterion uh, behind DLA uh, and indeed PIP for many years, that um, uh, for some people uh, who aren't able to work on any basis, uh, then it provides them uh, with means to kind of support their extra costs uh, in, in daily living. What I think can be particularly uh, important around uh, uh, ability to be employed and to, and to work as fully as possible is, is the mobility uh, component. So I absolutely agree. One of the criterion, uh, uh, one of the criteria that should be established in the evaluation criteria uh, uh, strategy is the impact on employment. I actually found it quite difficult uh, to track information at this stage uh, about the employment status of people getting the early PIP awards or not getting them. So I'm, I'm absolutely with you in terms of that's an important evaluation criteria. One, one final question, if I can, Convener. And you, you mentioned um, mental health conditions and um, the, the Convener and I previously uh, attended uh, an, an ATOS assessment uh, with an actress playing the part of somebody with a mental health condition and, you know, um, they probably had their best assessor uh, on the go that day, it would be, uh, I think, fair to say. But one of the things which we have found and an evidence that we've had um, from others uh, with mental health conditions uh, to this committee, um, we, we have found um, that, you know, uh, there is still, uh, it seems, a lack of awareness um, of the difficulties that some folk face with the conditions that they actually have. And you've highlighted uh, in your report that uh, we must uh, get better um, at dealing with that situation. But how do we ensure um, that the assessors out there um, are uh, completely and utterly au fait with the day-to-day -day difficulties that some folks uh, with mental health conditions have. How do we ensure that um, assessors um, are aware that, you know, when folk go for assessment, they often put on their best face? Um, and, you know, that may be the one day uh, in a month that somebody is at, at their top form. Uh, and we've heard, um, as I think the convener would agree, where uh, we've heard of folk going to assessment and then for the week, two weeks afterwards, they've been really ill because they've tried to boost themselves for that assessment. Uh, and, you know, that's taken a huge amount out of them. How do we get the assessment of folk with mental health conditions absolutely right? I think the short answer is absolutely ensuring the right level of training uh, 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 and experience sets is reflected um, amongst the assessors. Um, uh, I, uh, in one of the focus groups um, uh, that I held with claimants, it so happened that quite a large proportion of the people there with, with, with a mental health condition. Um, uh, I think their experience, uh, they were very openly telling me about, varied fairly considerably. Some had felt that the assessor that had seen them uh, 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 understood uh, very well, uh, the nature of their challenges, others were, were less impressed. So um, uh, what I've sought to emphasize during the review, not just in my report, but in the conversations I've been having, is about the importance of ensuring uh, the training uh, that is given to assessors who don't have a specialist mental health background uh, is sufficient to make them fully conversant with the issues and to know, frankly, if they are facing an issue where they might uh, feel the need to refer uh, the issue to a mental health specialist. Okay, thank you. Claire. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Mr. Gray. Um, the statistics that um, my colleague, Mr. Stewart, referred to earlier um, come from the DWP's most recent um, statistics on this. Um, it's the fourth set of statistics that they've produced and they were released uh, last week. Um, 
given that the volume of PIP applications is, is changing and the volume being processed has changed, um, are, are you convinced by the statistics so far that the general direction of travel is to improved times in terms of people being assessed? Um, uh, I won't claim to be on top of the latest figures. Um, I, I think the direction of travel uh, is right. I mean, it's clearly, uh, I won't say better than, less bad uh, than it was at particularly uh, poor points uh, in, in 2014, around the, the point I started uh, uh, my review. Um, uh, is it as good as it should be? Uh, uh, probably uh, not yet. Uh, but you know, I finished my review in December, and I, to be honest, I've not been keeping a kind of uh, regular tab on it day in, day out since. Um, uh, I'm sure there's still scope for improvement. Okay. You mentioned in your report um, suggesting using some sort of portal to keep people informed about, about the, the situation. Can you maybe say a bit more as why you think that might improve the, the client experience during the process? Uh, I think, and it picks up uh, comments Mr. Stewart was uh, was making earlier. If uh, if you, as a claimant in any kind of process, are struggling desperately to find out what's going on, uh, and you're phoning this one and phoning that one and and being kind of fobbed off, that's a very bad experience. Uh, I think if one thinks about what I personally would observe as um, uh, best practice um, in other spheres and sectors, for example, in the insurance sector, which I know is not a precise analogy, but I think it has some interesting uh, parallels. If you find yourself um, uh, in the middle of an insurance claim, as indeed I found myself uh, last year following a motor accident, um, uh, uh, traditionally it can be very hard to find out what's going on. Um, uh, I was quite impressed, uh, the experience I went through there, of having regular text messages uh, from my insurance company telling me exactly what stage things uh, uh, had reached. Um, I, I knew there was one phone number I could ring up um, uh, and a central point of contact who, who could tell me what was going on uh, with somebody who had access to all the information about you know, the two insurance companies who are involved, the two drivers who are involved, the various garages who are involved in kind of fixing vehicles. Um, uh, and what I'm advocating is something kind of broadly similar here. Yeah, there are lots of players involved at the moment uh, in this. Uh, I think it's perfectly feasible in this day and age to put together uh, a system uh, where you can bring all the information in one place. Now, should it be a kind of online portal or should it be a single telephone point? I think uh, I, I wouldn't uh, pretend we're at a stage now where an online tracking device is going to be the perfect option for every uh, PIP claimant. Uh, but I think increasingly over time, we're finding in all kinds of spheres People either on, uh, directly or people on their own behalf uh, are using online tracking systems uh, to um, uh, see where they are in a particular process. Internet deliveries is a kind of uh, huge example now where you know, you're expecting a parcel. By and large, with most providers now, you can find out exactly where that process is. I think the same approach could be applied in PIP, but you probably need to supplement it for people who are, remain uncomfortable with online with a much better integrated telephone system or whatever. I, I, I sort of preempted my next question was, has any significant work been done with the client base to ask them how would they would best likely to be informed? Because you know, the, the idea that everything would go onto a portal is, is of concern to me, especially since the Scottish Government has put dignity as a, a huge part of what's yeah. happening here and, and whether just improved customer service and improved communications you know should be the key to this and has anyone asked the client base about how they want to be kept informed um uh, i uh, only very informally in conversations i had was asking people about what what would be a better service and some some were saying online some were saying uh well you know a reliable kind of telephone service 
Um, uh, I, I don't particularly want to kind of emphasize, I think there's a particular technical solution. I made that suggestion. I think I said such as uh, a, a, an online tracker. Um, I don't want to be um, uh, presumptive about this. I think uh, it would be a very good thing for uh, DWP and indeed Scottish Government in carrying forward to get kind of input on exactly what kind of joined up service is required. What I'm in no doubt about is that a joined up service is required, not a disjointed one. I think, I think that kind of puts a bit a different picture on it slightly for me. So thank you for your answer. It's very helpful. Okay, Annabelle. Convener, uh, may I apologise, convener, to you and to Mr Gray for my late arrival. No problem. Um, Mr Gray, you, you mentioned that the UK government has accepted eight and a half of the nine short-term recommendations. Is it part of the role of your committee to monitor implement? Um, uh, well, one of the points I made, maybe before um, you came in, Ms Goldie, was to emphasise that I did not undertake this review simply because I was chairman of SSAC. Secretary of State asked me uh, uh, to undertake this review and as I was explaining earlier uh, that uh, I was at some pains to make clear I wasn't doing this as or because I was SSAC chairman. So in terms of carrying forward um, uh, the implementation uh, of this report, no, I don't think it's a specific responsibility of SSAC. Um, I don't think, frankly, it's a kind of personal responsibility of mine. I was asked to undertake the review uh, and I reported. I think the responsibility kind of rests squarely uh, with government to uh, follow through the implementation. A more general question about whether SSAC uh, uh, might take a continuing interest in this uh, is a kind of more open question. I mean, SSAC has two roles. Uh, in statute, uh, in UK statute. One is um, uh, in relation to formal scrutiny of draft regulations uh, that come to us. That's a statutory role. Um, uh, our other slightly free arranging role is to uh, decide within pretty limited resources, frankly, what are uh, wider issues within the welfare system that we think it is valuable for us as a committee uh, uh, to look into. So over the last year we've done a number uh, of reports on, uh, on different aspects uh, of the welfare system. It is possible my colleagues and I might conclude uh, that an in-depth look uh, at PIP might be appropriate, but uh, there's a kind of whole range of issues we could be spending limited time and resources on, and as I say, there's certainly no presumption that there's a role here for SSAC because I did not undertake the review as chair of SSAC. Okay, thank you. You said in your introductory general remarks, I think in relation to assessments, that your impression was they were more overall medical and less functional, I think the mm. word was the one which you used. And this is a question slightly in consequence of the area being examined by my yeah. colleague, Mr Stewart. Can you, for the benefit of the committee, just tease this out a bit? Yes. Um, so the um, uh, the assessment criteria um, uh, for uh, PIP, which are kind of spelt out um, uh, in great detail in my report, you know, spell out over 12 um, activities of daily living or mobility uh, the degree of functional impairment uh, or uh, support need uh, uh, that people have, uh, whether it's in relation to mobility or different aspects of care, whether it's uh, preparing food, uh, washing and dressing, toileting needs. So what the assessment is trying to do is say, under each of those headings on a sliding point scale, what what degree of kind of functional support do people need in order to carry out those aspects of daily living uh, or those aspects of mobility? So the fundamental thing that's being assessed is, you know, how much can you do? What extra support assistance do you need in order to carry out those activities? That to me is functional. Um, uh, 
clearly people's underlying medical conditions have a very strong influence and impact on that. The fact people have functional impairments, you know, it's, whether uh, physical uh, or mental, uh, reflects uh, their underlying medical conditions. However, um, I think we all know from sort of a everyday experience uh, that uh, people, two people with absolutely identical uh, underlying uh, medical conditions will not necessarily uh, have the same functional impact. I think I said somewhere in my introduction to the report, if I can find the phrase, um, um, that the key premise here is that different people with the same underlying conditions may well experience significantly different functional impacts. This will reflect the complex interaction of many factors, including physiological, psychological, motivational, and social. So functional assessment is not a precise science, and accurately and consistently assessing several million awards in this way is a formidable undertaking. So that's really the distinction I'm on. And what I observed, uh, both in written material and when I watched assessments, uh, is that all the first questions um, uh, that are asked are about medical conditions. And I sort of understand that because you, you have to start there. But the, uh, the clear impact I think that's having on people, and I certainly observed it in the claimant groups I talked to, is that they felt a large proportion of the time in the assessment and the early stages of the assessment were all about medical. And that, I observed, having quite a large impact on whether kind of people understood uh, that uh, this actually is a functional assessment. So everybody, almost without exception, talking to me referred to when I went for my medical. Uh, they didn't talk about when I went for my, my assessment. And I'm pleased to see in the... Uh, DWP's response, uh, my recommendations on, on on this point, that they have undertaken to seek to both make clearer to claimants in all the kind of literature uh, and the uh, award material and emphasise uh, to the assessors uh, that the amount of time and focus spent on uh, medical information should be kept to the necessary minimum, and thorough exploration of the functional impact, the reliability uh, of functional impact should be more thoroughly explored and, and, and focused on. A final question, if I may, right. Convener. Um, again, it's um, rather in consequence of what Mr. Stewart was, was examining you on. What would I do without you, Mr. Stewart? <laughs> um, and it's, it's this broad area of the state or condition of the individual when presenting for yeah. assessment. And Mr. Stewart made, I think, a, an important point, which is a lot rests on that one session, on that one occasion. Did you think that the assessment process was sufficiently flexible to allow the assessor to get an accurate impression of what the applicant may be confronting, particularly given your very helpful comment just a moment ago, that we can't just look at this as a medical diagnosis and confirmation of what the medical condition is, that there actually has to be considered what does that mean in terms of mobility and independence and dignity, as Claire Adamson was saying. Um, uh, up to a point is, would be my kind of summary response of did, uh, you know, how satisfactory did I think that was. Um, uh, I probably had the, um, the same thought as Mr. Stewart referred to, that you know, I spent quite a lot of time observing assessments. Um, when you're an observer to any process, you inevitably constitute interference in that process, even if you don't intend it. And Mr. Stewart, I think, reasonably observed there may be a tendency to kind of encourage uh, best behaviour on the part of the, uh, of the people you're observing. So... Um, what I saw in what I viewed as the kind of best assessments was uh, a very uh, 
clear focus by the assessor in exploring, um, having discussed, you know, what's, what's the kind of impact today, what was people's descriptors, was, so how typical is this? How many days a week is it like this? How many days a week is it worse than this? How many days a week is it better than this? How variable is it? Does it fluctuate? So I think I saw some very good examples. Um, I observed a few examples which I wouldn't say were bad, but they were kind of less good uh, than that. And in talking to people who'd gone through the process and then the written evidence I got, I got quite a lot of input that said, we don't think this sort of reliability exploration and the kind of fluctuating conditions uh, uh, dynamics for many people are perhaps being explored as fully uh, as they should be. Uh, so it's for that reason uh, that amongst my recommendations I've emphasised uh, the importance of further focus uh, being given both kind of in the training and the evaluation and observation uh, uh, of assessments of ensuring that that is done uh, uh, appropriately and reliably. Um, uh, it's very, there is a kind of a, a difficulty um, uh, of doing that consistently reliably in face-to-face -face assessments. There are, of course, a proportion of assessments which are done on paper and the judgments reach there's no need to call the person to a face-to-face -face assessment. I think it's particularly important to make sure where decisions, are, as it were, just being made on paper, that there is enough evidence presented uh, on paper, again, to allow assessors to judge uh, that, that issue of um, uh, is the variability. So I, I agree. I think it's quite an issue. I, getting to a council of perfection on this will be really difficult. Is there a need to kind of emphasise it more? I suspect so, yes. Uh, have DWP in their response picked up and made the right noises in response to my observations and recommendations? Yes, they have. But as I said at the beginning, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. And very briefly, Convener, following on from that answer, which is, I think, most helpful, the mandatory reconsideration available to a claimant is within one month of the decision being taken. Is that sufficiently flexible? In terms of the, the length of time? Mm. Um, uh, I think in most cases uh, it should be as long as there is adequate resourcing in place to make sure that the um, reconsiderations are done. If where, where it could be a difficulty, I think, is if um, uh, uh, part of the the issue that a claimant is bringing into a mandatory reconsideration is I think there is evidence uh, that was not given uh, sufficient emphasis or which I don't feel was kind of brought to bear, then I think there could be an issue of um, uh, the elapsed time in going out and, and gathering that additional evidence. Um, uh, so I can see a kind of potential uh, uh, difficulty there, but I would hope the process is sufficiently flexible that um, uh, if uh, somebody wants to go through mandatory reconsideration, feels that there isn't, there is some evidence that they've not been able to lay their hands on, that they would actually kind of proceed with the application for mandatory reconsideration and point to the evidence they feel needs to be obtained. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Joan, to be followed by Margaret. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, Mr Gray, on um, paragraph 9 of your executive summary, uh, you talk about the uh, published data on PIP awards um, and how 55% of new claims have received an award, and that's higher than was originally expected, and even the Office of Budget Responsibility is now projecting a higher success rate for new claims than the original forecast. Now, you've also you know, made, made the perfectly reasonable <laughs> observation that, the, that this whole process is actually about cutting costs, ultimately. And last week, um, or the last committee hearing, we heard research from Sheffield Hallam University that shows that the Treasury's increased its anticipated savings in terms of the transfer from DLA to PIP by a billion um, 
to 2017-18. And I suppose in that context, although we are comparing new claims to um, transfer claims, it, it does seem to me that, um, that there is a danger that assessors will be under tremendous pressure to assess claimants on the basis of uh, the funds available rather than need. Um, that's clearly a risk. Um, uh, what I saw uh, and observed was uh, assessors looking to do the assessments on the basis of the very precise descriptors that are laid down in those 12 functional uh, uh, characteristics. Um, uh, and similarly, uh, uh, departmental decision makers, I think, are doing their best in what is a difficult process to come to the best judgments uh, uh, they can. Uh, so uh, I certainly didn't see uh, any evidence to, to suggest that, but clearly uh, you're right to kind of highlight one could conceive of that as a risk. I mean, do you think that given that the, the number of new claimants is, is, or successful new claimants is higher than anticipated, might not the, the, the number of um, DLA to PIP cases be higher than anticipated, which would obviously affect the number somewhat? Frankly, I think all, all outcomes are possible uh, here. Um, uh, all these projections are done by people uh, doing their best to come up with uh, estimates of what they think the impact of a change in the system uh, will be. The likelihood those estimates are absolutely spot on is probably uh, not very high. And as, as you pointed out, what we saw in the kind of first phase of new claims is the favourable outcomes being rather slightly higher than had been assumed. Um, as I said earlier, I think the big test of this process uh, and of the uh, current uh, rely of the reliability of the current assessments is what will happen when existing DLA claimants are being reassessed under the new process, because that's where the kind of bulk of the uh, uh, the impact one way or another uh, will come through and because there's, there's I think at the point I wrote the report of the um, uh, um, awards uh, decisions that had been reached at that stage I think 96 percent uh, were new claims and only four percent were this small proportion of people who on DLA who come forward for reassessment. So we, there's really very little evidence at the moment of what will happen in that critical phase. Okay. I also wanted to talk to you about, you have did a lot of work on the, 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 the claimant journey and the, the experience, and you mentioned the, the assessment letters as being difficult to, uh, to understand. Um, there is also an issue about the length of the form itself. Um, I understand that the PIP2 forms about 35 pages long and that's um, going to be very difficult for some people, particularly people with a learning disability. Um, why did you not make any particular recommendation about the length of the form? Um, I think there's a difficult balance to strike here. If, if you're trying to do a reliable and thorough assessment, it goes back to in a sense some of the questions Ms Goldie was asking me around you know, a complex assessment of functional impact on to, uh, on 12 different criteria, then it does call for um, uh, uh, quite a lot of kind of, uh, uh, of detailed information. Um, uh, equally, you're right, it could be, uh, you know, a kind of put off to, to some people of kind of going through that process. Uh, but I, I didn't feel this was an area... Uh, uh, particularly, uh, I thought in this early stage, it was right to recommend significant changes uh, because I think the kind of risk is uh, that you dilute the quality of the information uh, that's informing the decisions. Right. Um, I should declare an interest here, Kavina, and I've got a close member of my family with a learning disability, so I'm, um, and I'm going to pursue that line of questioning. I wouldn't imagine many people with a learning disability would have been new claimants, so, so therefore um, it's hard. I, I understand that it's hard for you to talk about their experience, but you do mention their experience and some concerns that you have, um, but there's no evidence uh, as yet, presumably because not many of them are... Uh, new claimants. Um, clearly there's a 
there is a real danger here that people who are extremely vulnerable um, will, will have difficulties in, in, in getting essential benefits. Do you think um, we should be putting more in place to protect those people in terms of advocacy, in terms of making sure that they're steered through the process properly? Well, I think there is a kind of big issue underlying <coughs> your question about uh, the degree of support that is available to people who have difficulty claiming, whether it's a learning disability or, or, or any other uh, impairment. Um, traditionally, of course, that has been a significant role for third sector organisations. Um, uh, they, at a time of stringency, uh, are kind of facing pressures uh, on their ability uh, to support people in claims. I certainly heard um, evidence uh, uh, that uh, quite a number of the organisations who've traditionally operated uh, in this space to support vulnerable claimants are finding it difficult uh, to resource the degree of support um, uh, that some claimants are feeling uh, that they need. But I think the, in a sense, that feels to me um, uh, the bigger issue and the more important issue rather than uh, um, uh, is too much kind of information being sought from people uh, in order to validate a claim or otherwise. Is there something built into the system if a person doesn't have that third sector support or their advocacy support? Is, are there safeguards built into the system to ensure that those people don't fall through the net? Um, not in the sense that um, it seems to me the, the clear presumption now, as indeed in the, uh, for many years past, uh, is that... Um, for this type of benefit, uh, uh, there is access to it, but fundamentally uh, it is the kind of responsibility uh, of the individual to kind of come forward uh, to, uh, to seek to claim it. So I think it's a big issue. I'm not sure it's a new issue um, uh, in relation to PIP, other than possibly that third sector organisations find themselves as do many other organisations, under greater financial pressure now than they may have been in the past. Yeah. And finally, the reassessments a big part of that, this process, mandatory reassessment. Do you think that's necessary for someone who, I mean, uh, who, who, who simply ha has a very, very severe disability, which means that they can't work, that they need to keep going back through this process of mandatory reassessment? Well, I think it's... Um, uh, appropriate to be uh, flexible about this. Um, one of the things I commented adversely on was uh, a, a sense I got that in terms of the early awards under PIP, there did seem to be kind of rather a heavy focus on what um, I thought was most unfortunately termed kind of interventions of uh, people kind of uh, being gone back to to, to check if there had been uh, uh, any change of circumstances. Um, uh, I think it's not unreasonable uh, to move away from a system where uh, either explicitly or, or implicitly uh, people are on li complete lifetime awards uh, uh, for benefits. So some degree of periodic review seems to be not unreasonable. I think that ought to be flexible. Uh, uh, and uh, for people who clearly have uh, uh, severe impairments where all the evidence suggests the likelihood of their improving uh, is minimal, uh, uh, then that should be kind of at, at, the, at the least kind of intensive uh, end of the spectrum. Um, uh, but con conversely, where there is a significant likelihood of change in one direction or the other, uh, then I think it's not unreasonable uh, to have some kind of review process. But is there enough flexibility um, to take account for the fact? Because we already have heard that the whole process is quite stressful. So if, if, if someone has a condition that's very severe and is not going to change, if someone's paraplegic or has a but severe learning and physical disabilities that are just not going to change, to put them through that stressful situation yeah. is... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there is yet enough... Uh, flexibility, but in a sense, we won't really know until this 
key stage of mandatory reassessment uh, rolls out. One of the things which there was early focus on uh, and where I think a significant improvement was introduced, uh, thanks in large part to excellent work by Macmillan Cancer, was uh, uh, around people with uh, terminal illness conditions. And the very early days, that was a very unsatisfactory process, a new streamlined and, as it were, bespoke process that's suitable for people in that you know, particularly uh, difficult stage of life has been introduced and I think has been widely welcomed. Um, uh, what I'm concerned about is not just sort of taking that particularly difficult segment at kind of one end of the spectrum and then saying kind of everybody else uh, is in exactly the same position. So as part of kind of redesigning the system and being flexible, uh, I think I used the phrase somewhere it shouldn't be one size fits all and it should kind of have those, those flexibilities within it. But as I say, I think it's not unreasonable that an underlying principle of review is built into the system. Thank you very much. I'm going to take Margaret and if I've got time uh, to come back to Annabelle and Claire for short supplementaries. But I know Paul has to be away by 12 o'clock, so if people bear that in mind, Margaret. I can probably probably spare a few minutes, but I do have a plan to catch it up as one, so thank you. Um, thank you, uh, convener, and good morning. Um, so it's the worst of coming in at the end when most of your questions have already been asked. Um, so I will ask a question around... Um, the disconnect between the IT systems, uh, which you know we have um, spoken about earlier, and how likely is it that that is going to actually change? And will the resources be provided to ensure that there is that better and easier access to information for applicants? Well, I'm not sure because it's you know not not my responsibility. But I have made clear I think that is uh, a priority to sort it. You know, given a degree of experience in in kind of former lives in running uh, big programs, including IT systems, I see no technical reason why this shouldn't be uh, done. Um, uh, uh, and if it's not, I would regard it as kind of highly regrettable because, um, go back to my phrase about it kind of being disjointed, this is, this is just kind of unacceptable. Okay, so we can look forward to that being... Well, I hope so. Uh, I, I'm not the implementer, but I've, I hope I've made my views very clear on it, both in the report and subsequently and today. Like <coughs> most of my colleagues, I was uh, really surprised to hear about the you know the communication and the letters that were sent out and you know you said yourself that you couldn't really understand the letters that were sent out as a, the outcomes of assessments so i'm pleased to hear that you know that is being reviewed and will be looked at so how often are these staff checks carried out and how often you know are the quality checks carried out on the likes of letters and um, how well and how consistent these are? Um, I think it, leave, it still leaves a fair amount to be desired. I, mean, I can't give you precise figures on you know, what proportion of, uh, of letters uh, are checked. Um, uh, what, um, uh, where I was keen to put most focus was, I think, uh, having, as it were, the sort of the standard structure of decision letters in a much better shape uh, uh, would uh, be a big step in the right direction. I think actually one of my criticisms was the kind of fundamental structure of the standard letters was wrong because you had to get to something like the bottom of the second page to find out whether or not you got an award. Uh, I mean, it seems to me in any letter which is seeking to explain, you know, what might be quite a complicated thing o overall. The first thing you need to know when you read the letter is you have been awarded at rate X, or, or you haven't been awarded, and then there's lots of kind of explanatory stuff that that possibly uh, needs to follow. So, I, I don't think it's a, as much about you know individual checking of letters, but having the basic templates that people use in a much better and more sensible structure. There is as I know again from kind of former lives, there is 
always an inherent difficulty uh, with social security benefits of making sure that, if I can be blunt, the, the letters aren't overly influenced by legal advice and legal requirements without being rude about the legal profession uh, or uh, not deliberately rude about the legal profession. Quite often you can get in a position where you know, lawyers say that this, this, these kind of precise words need to be used. Uh, and I think it's important to kind of listen to that advice carefully but then think actually how do we get the best marrying between what needs to be said legally in order to kind of reflect the law but doing it in a way that the average person has the opportunity to have a decent chance of understanding what's being said to them rather than feeling there's a lot of legal speak being put to them. I mean um, similarly for the consistencies or the lack of consistencies in assessments and uh, you know I've already heard about the letters so how often is that going to be checked up on? That, you know that. I mean, how op often is it checked up on just now? And will there be an increase in the number of these quality checks carried out? I don't honestly know the the, the figures on that. Um, what I'm moderately pleased about is the commitment from DWP to have a major review uh, of, of the structure of the letters. Um, just through the convener, is there a time scale for when this, uh, imp these, your recommendations will be implemented? Well, the, the short, what I term my short-term recommendations, I said uh, these should be fully implemented before the start of managed reassessment, which up to this point has been said to be October, starting in October this year. So that was what I. That was the time frame I put on what uh, I thought was uh, uh, would be right. Um, I'm taking it as implicit, if not explicit, in the department's response to the report uh, that they're accepting that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, convener. Yeah, I'll take Annabelle and Claire's questions together uh, because I think they both reacted to something that was being said, so I think they might be connected. Uh, Annabelle, do you want to go first? It's very brief. Is it possible to accept the merit of a principle of reviewing an assessment without that being incompatible with a presumption that in certain cases review, as Joe McAlpine was pointing out, would to most people be unnecessary. I mean, can the principle not be honoured in the implement, but there can be introduced a presumption in certain cases that further assessments are clearly unnecessary and indeed will only subject the claimant to distress. Absolutely. Um, I think some of the evidence this committee has taken has, has shown that the process can indeed be detrimental to the health of the people involved in especially mental health cases and someone with MS, MND, cerebral palsy as we mentioned, they aren't going to get any significant improvement and indeed probing as to when end of life the doctors have like side of life time scales with them and things can be absolutely dehumanising for people and I just don't understand why that can't be built into this process. Well I think in a sense that that has been built into the special rules cases for terminal illness already. So Someone diagnosed with MND the average lifespan is, is, is just over two years yeah. so at what point do they become terminal terminal ill? I mean, they've been given a terminal diagnosis, as many people with cancer have, but their medical staff might not have said any time scale into which they yeah. expect them to reach well, an end of life situation. And, and, and this is the, the dehumanising aspect of the whole thing. Some people are so ill that they're never going to yeah. improve and get out of this situation. And it seems that the system should be able to cope with that. I think we're in danger of kind of fiercely agreeing, actually, on this, rather than, rather than disagreeing, in that... Um, what I was saying in terms of seeking to build in flexibility is that um, uh, uh, for people who haven't been diagnosed as terminally ill within, within six months but have kind of severe, severe disabling kind of health conditions, um, uh, I would have thought it was appropriate uh, certainly to uh, uh, make an award with at least a very long time period before the possibility of a further review. Whether it's appropriate in any cases of people who haven't 
have formally been assessed as being terminally ill, it's appropriate to say it's a lifetime award. I think you can kind of argue that uh, either way, but I think I'm accepting the principle of what, what, what you're all saying of kind of recognise the severity uh, at the point either a new award or a kind of um, the first PIP award for a DLA claimant and be sensible and flexible about the time period indicated uh, for any review. Okay, I said you wanted to wait by 12 o'clock, but I'm going to abuse the fact, <laughs> the fact that you said that you had maybe just one or two minutes. Um, <clears throat> just one more question on PIP, um, and it's just uh, the type of question that a convener asks anyone who's, who's come in front of, of the committee, um, if there was something else you would want to add um, to what you've already said, but a specific sort of question to get you into that territory. If you were presented with a, a blank sheet of paper at the moment, um, and asked to, to put down your thoughts on PIP, where would you start? Um, if I started with, if, if I had a genuinely blank sheet of paper and I was starting in a system where there wasn't a legacy benefit, uh, uh, I'm not sure that I would, um, uh, I think I would ask kind of fairly fundamental questions about whether the, the key underlying principles uh, of this benefit are the ones that you want to adopt uh, in the present circumstance. So would you, uh, uh, for example, uh, have uh, keep it kind of completely independent of income? Uh, would you keep it completely independent of tax? Um, uh, uh, I think it's a question worth that would be worth asking in those circumstances. Um, the problem is nobody has got a blank sheet of paper here because there is this existing caseload uh, of DLA. Uh, and the challenge you have uh, in Scotland in thinking about how you want to look at this in future uh, is that uh, it's the classic one in any change in social security benefits of what do you do about potential losers. And Mr. Stewart and others have, uh, have pointed to the, uh, the kind of power uh, of that point. So um, saying, you know, we don't, um, we want to kind of redesign PIP in a very different way to DLA, but with kind of, without impacting uh, on the existing coast load is is really difficult. So I guess one possibility, if one concluded, actually we want to have something quite different in future, uh, would be to treat new claims uh, differently uh, from existing claims. Uh, but of course that the the kind of legacy runs on hopefully for many years, and one hopes most people aren't in the position of. Uh, near term level illness that, that actually there's a very long time period to uh, to run through so um, I'd like to have more of a blank sheet of paper than actually I think anybody realistically faces I'm sorry if that's not very helpful but I think it it just reflects the challenge that anybody has in saying I want to reshape a social security system yeah no that's that's perfectly fair uh, I won't take up any more of your time asking questions. Uh, I know you want to get away, but we did uh, mention that you had looked into ESA regulations. Yeah. We, we were contacted specifically by yeah. a member of the public uh, about a question to do with ESA regulations. So if you don't mind, we'll write to you. Okay, well, we'll I'm, I'm, I'm happy to spend kind of two minutes on that, if you like. Well, we'll ask you the question, then. Are you happy yeah. to do that? Um, the, the, the question... Uh, focused around the proposals designed to address the government's concerns that existing ESA rules encourage claimants to loop around the system. The intention is that claimants that have been found fit for work should be prevented from returning to ESA, and that's a benefit that during the assessment phase has no element of conditionality, that unless an existing health condition has deteriorated significantly or a new condition has developed, um, they want to, to address that issue. The... the person who's written to us uh, wants to know what evidence is there in support of the alleged loophole in the first place uh, in those ESA regulations and is there any statistical information about the number of people who are said to be using it? Uh, 
Yeah, well, here, here I do speak with my SSAC chair hat on, um, uh, in that uh, this was a set of regulations that came to us last autumn, as they're required to do uh, under the statute. Um, uh, those were the very questions that we asked ourselves as a committee, and, and when we had DWP officials presenting the, the draft regulations uh, to us. Um, and you know, the, 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 the initial decision the committee has to take on these occasions is, are we having kind of uh, explored them, going to say we're content that they should proceed without a kind of formal process, uh, or do we, as the committee, wish in the terminology to take them on formal reference and then potentially go out to consultation? Uh, on this occasion, we took the latter view for essentially... Uh, the reasons that your correspondent uh, was flagging, that the, uh, the information that was presented to us on the actual or potential number of people who were looping the system was frankly very thin in the documentation that was uh, uh, presented to us. Um, uh, and uh, as we explored it, and particularly in the uh, consultation process, there were a number of quite serious concerns we had uh, about uh, the way in which these ch the, the impact these, uh, these changes would have. Again, a particular issue is around people with mental health conditions, to come back to one of the issues we've been, we've been talking about earlier. So uh, because, largely because, or partly because, we didn't have clear evidence presented to us by the department, we went out to consultation. We had a couple of meetings, including one in Glasgow, one in London, uh, with representative bodies to seek to explore uh, what was the, the likely reality. In fact, uh, uh, during that process, the department did then uh, come up with some estimate uh, uh, of the number of people who might be affected. Um, so there was something... Um, uh, they looked at the kind of total number of people coming to ESA assessments and looked at what proportion of those were people who were reapplying with what seemed to be broadly unchanged health conditions. And actually it was um, something a little under 4% of the total uh, were of that category. So in our report... Uh, back to the Secretary of State, which because he had to publish and lay uh, before the Westminster Parliament. Our recommendation was, in fact, that the regulations change should not proceed. Um, uh, we were not persuaded uh, of the case for a number of reasons. Um, uh, 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 and uh, we made a number of kind of more detailed recommendations if the Secretary of State in his wisdom or otherwise chose not to follow our recommendation uh, some mitigations we thought should be put in place. His decision uh, was to proceed with the regulations but I'm pleased to say uh, that most of the, the other more detailed recommendations that we made uh, uh, around uh, uh, ensuring guidance uh, was uh, much improved and various other changes uh, were actually adopted. But I'd be very happy to kind of write to you uh, with more detail on that would be helpful. I mean, there is, uh, if you want to pursue it, there is the, all these reports need to be kind of published and laid in front of Parliament. So uh, this document, which I'm happy to leave with uh, uh, your Secretariat, includes both our full report uh, and the Secretary of State's response. But I'm very happy to have more correspondence about it as well. I think that would be very welcome. Anything that helps to clarify the situation would be... And it's, be I mean, it's actually an interesting example, I think, of the way SSAC operates yeah. uh, in relation to uh, current Westminster legislation. And, and you might want to reflect on the need for some similar processes as indeed benefits are devolved to Scotland. Yeah, no, that's, that's certainly worth considering and something that we'll be looking at when we look at the Smith Commission recommendations. But, Paul, thanks very much the, this, this morning for your time. I, I found that very helpful and enlightening. Um, we may have to look at uh, having you back at some point in the future as things progress, but um, I certainly found it helpful this morning, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. And Pleasure with that, I'll bring the meeting to a close by pointing out our next meeting will be because of the recess on the 21st of April, 
where we expect to hear oral evidence on the impact of welfare reform on children's services. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone.